I'm really happy to see all of you because I think Kubernetes is for me probably the most interesting to, to hear and to talk and to do and to work with recently. Um, so that's why I want to talk about Docker and Kubernetes as well as how to make it a success at your company. Because I think Kubernetes has definitely been uh, in the hype cycle for a very long time and, and especially also with Docker now supporting it, especially it's going to be something uh, the, the definitive now of like how are you, you going to run your containers. Um, so that's why it's interesting and, and the way that they're doing it right now working with Kubernetes is just, is just making it so much better. So, but I think that we can generally agree on Kubernetes is hard. I don't think anybody who have ever had the experience to say, yeah, I really like Kubernetes because it's just so easy to use. And, and I think that's also some of the problems sometimes, like figuring out is Kubernetes the right tool for the job? And I'm actually here to argue that it is the right tool for everyone. Because I think Kubernetes is this new thing where we're essentially having to build upon and I think that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Like, how is it that this Kubernetes tool is right for you? And what is it that makes it the right tool? So I think if you're talking about what is it that makes it a good decision or a good tool uh, to use Kubernetes, I think there is, there's a lot of reasons, but there is a reason. And that is basically do not reinvent the wheel. Because I think if you've ever gone to a scene X amount of companies, you can make a operation and see X amount of different setups. And it's basically, that's a pretty normal thing. You go in, you, you have your assumptions, you make your decision based on what kind of, of uh, application you have. But if, but if you have X amount of companies, it also means that people are spending a lot of time like, figuring these setups up. Like, how should we connect them? How should we structure them? The security, scaling, different clouds. Like, how do you do it on Amazon, Azure, and so forth? And you're essentially being a little bit reinventing the wheel all the time. And if, if you do this equation, it also means that lots of money to consultants. Because in the end, I... Who here likes to work on, on some like really complicated problem or co uh, where there's a project that's so old and nobody really knows how it's documented and you essentially have to figure out stuff uh, once you go on and because it's so, it's not the same at the new company as the company you worked before, you kind of have to figure out some of the new stuff. So I'm essentially saying like nobody wants to work on old projects and I think that's maybe uh, some things to consider. Because I think if nobody actually wants to work on old projects, uh, unless actually there is one case that we actually paid a lot, then do we uh, get paid for the amount of pain that we inflict on ourselves? Is that how we are now rating? It's like, oh, okay, this is fucking hard, or like uh, I need to get paid a lot to do this because like it's not fun at all. So, so if you're an analyst, I think, but let's analyze this a little bit. What is it that means that we are having hard problems but it's because it's old and undocumented and it's a different setup each time. What is it, how can we maybe change this so it's actually fun to do these problems? And I think you suddenly begin to like, oh, it's actually pretty nice to start from scratch. Like, yeah, I, could do, I want to do that. I want to do that new, new project over there. Like, can I switch team or uh, maybe figure out if I can get a new job that pays a better or... But what if you actually just could start from scratch each time? Like every time you start a new project, each month you start a new project, maybe each day. Maybe you can actually try the new framework. I heard uh, a lot of things about Micronaut, uh, this conference. And I think this is some of the things like, why can't we just start a new project with Micronaut? Why is it that we're kind of stuck on these old projects where it's actually really hard to find the documentation? Uh, it would actually be nice if you could find the documentation and not have to go back to find the old version and such. And you're suddenly saying, like, this is some of the things that makes it really hard. So it would also be nice to work on a project that starts pretty quickly because, like, I've been on projects where you begin to add all these things and every time you have to start it, it basically takes forever because it has to load so many services and controllers and such that it's actually a problem suddenly just getting it up and running because, like, you need to read this readme and, and all these steps that are custom, basically, for every time, for every project. You have to figure this out. 
And as well with all these projects that are both complicated, it's also about all these inherent knowledge and on how it's working. And the problem is again, like, this makes it more complicated and it goes on, it just begins to take it forever and forever. So for, I think this is actually a funny thing, like it's actually in German, I saw it on Twitter, or I can translate. It's basically a, a COBOL programmer and he's reading his code on the mainframe and he sees a comment and it's from 1985 and it's from his mom. That says a little bit about like how code long, how long does it live actually? Uh, he's finding his comment and that was how old he was like going back in the code he was editing uh, from his mom that I would like to look forward to that when I maybe from 30 years from now my my children can say okay this is or I hope not because actually that's terrible because like, uh, who actually would remember all this stuff what was they thinking and there's actually another comment uh, down below he's saying like oh his mom wrote that it was good it was a really good code because if you had to put it in the it, uh, puncture paper it would be half a meter long the code so he's actually he was like really happy about that code at that time so that tells a little bit about like that's difficult to figure out and remember as well so let's try to like, why is it that we don't start from scratch? Like what is it that then prohibits us really from doing these projects over and over again and because we continue developing on these old projects? And this is because there's a lot of things that are already done for us. That's for example the reason you're not allowed. That's a, good, that's a pretty typical one, like you have your boss, you're basically, he has some commitments he has to finish and he has to do certain things by a certain time. It's also, it's difficult. You maybe have to ask another team to do it. You maybe have to uh, also wait for the hardware to actually provision. And sometimes there's also metrics. That's often the thing where you're, you're suddenly, we need to have those metrics to figure out how is your application doing? How is the load doing on the service? You also need to have the scalability. You also need to have the maintainability because like, I know there's programming languages people are choosing now just because they know they can hire people because they don't want to do a project in a new programming language where they don't know if people are actually able to continue working on it. So these are the problems that we're having, uh, right? And, and these are some of the pretty good things because if you are suddenly beginning to think about, oh, like if I have to start this, you're both having a problem of making a new project and you are as well trying to solve these on a new project. And these are very difficult. That's why we're not doing it. That's why like whenever you're saying, okay, we just spent two months making this scalable, we don't want to waste this. So I think basically what it leads into a little bit about like how do I self experience this in, in a manner that was uh, made me figure out that Kubernetes was the right tool for me. Because the first thing I did was I worked in an IT consult company and there uh, I was basically the only one who was really trying to, to make these new services and figure out can I start new projects because they were working with the old legacy CMS system and I wanted to try on Braco and such. But the problem was totally always I could get a VPS but suddenly you were, I was the only one who actually knew how to set it up. And not only would I, maybe I could have documented it but you also need to have the process of how do you release a new version. And these things are really difficult because suddenly I was the only one who had the knowledge and because it wasn't standard, the bus factor or how I heard about the lotto factor, lotto factor where like how many people do you need to disappear before you're actually really, uh, really difficult to continue. I should not swear so much. <laughs> so, but then the, the next project where I was experiencing something was like, then we had the uh, Dong Energy. I was working at the largest uh, energy provider, and there they were using uh, SharePoint. I don't know how many have tried SharePoint, uh, and so far I will try to say nice things about it. Or, uh, I'm actually not sure I can say nice things about it, uh, because it's really, really a weird platform. Like, it's both uh, really made for uh, maintainability for these like, uh, database administrators, and it's also tried to be like a platform for programmers, but it's not really good at anything. And it's just really, really expensive. <laughs> and <laughs> it's just really expensive. And it's just so slow. And you're kind of like, you're basically being able, to, when you compile something for SharePoint, you're basically taking a compile and then you're going out for coffee because you're basically waiting for it. And you're suddenly, 
It's not fun, but they had the basic idea of having a platform where you could basically have stuff working on top of it. If people were making up new, uh, new web servers left and right at Dong Energy, at a company where we had 20,000 employees, you basically, you are basically left for really, uh, that was weird. You're basically left in the wild because you can't, you need to have a structured system where people are running things and they're kind of committing to do something. Then was also in an ad agency where we were running around 200 websites. And we were running it with PHP. It seems uh, pretty popular because you can do it really cheap, and that's some, apparently something that's really uh, important for a lot of companies. And we were running these 200 websites, mostly WordPress and, and, uh, and Drupal, and we were doing this uh, uh, on two servers. Because the people uh, who were very focused on price really wanted to cut down. And it was created by this really, really uh, talented guy. Like, he, was, he was the first one. He, he made it with, uh, on free BSD. It, just, it also just tells you something. And he made it with jails. And it was actually the first time I was, uh, experienced uh, containers. But the problem was like, that guy got a no new job. And then nobody figured out had any experience with free FreeBSD, let alone jail. So you can kind of imagine how we were stuck in a system where you were basically uh, only hoping that it wouldn't go down, uh, which it actually did a lot of times. And <laughs> that was not even the main problem. The main problem was that these 200 websites, then if one of the websites just got a lot of traffic, it would basically take the whole other 200 websites down because they weren't made to scale. And basically, some customer would, would normally install a newsletter plugin for WordPress, and that WordPress plugin would just hit our web server so hard because it was sending out 200,000 emails, and, and it was just like uh, hitting our service, and we were basically we were calling our customer, please don't install WordPress plugins. It's like, but it's also a little bit like they're doing their business, and they're trying to earn money, and we should be able to, fight, we should be able to provide them a web service, or at least say how should we move from here. And the problem was, like, we should really have gotten, like, how, how can we actually deliver this so we have each customer have dedicated resources that are able to be provided for each customer. So that was, you should really have resource control. And then also we were working on a job portal uh, where we were using PHP again, and it's pretty popular between startups, apparently. Uh, and then the problem was here was, like, they have actually got this vSphere uh, from a local provider, and they were using... A sand cluster, and it was all really well. The problem was just like, how do you actually keep these servers up to date once you're continuing uh, running these? Because suddenly we were running Debian 6, and some of the new stuff we were trying to run was on Debian 8, and we couldn't compile stuff. And it was like, we need to upgrade these servers, but the servers hasn't been upgraded for as long as we have been set up because they have been created. Then nobody had a strategy on how to keep updating, taking them down, replacing them with new software, applying updates. And these things is just really important because not only were we behind on the new software, you are also exposing ourselves to new security threats as well. And this is just something like you begin to see maybe there is a couple of patterns where you think, Mm, it's actually really, really hard, and every company was really trying to do the best, but it was just so difficult. And I think this is where you're saying, now Kubernetes is, <coughs> Kubernetes is, is becoming this, um, <coughs> that's really, a, <coughs> a really, oh, what is, like I have a frog. But Kubernetes is then becoming this community. And I think this is what, it makes it so exciting. This is why you should be really looking at it now and not a year ago or two years ago, because what it means that it becomes a commodity is that basically every cloud provider that has something, even DigitalOcean, which is, was kind of surprised, announced at KubeCon that they are now providing uh, Kubernetes as a service. And this means actually that you're now moving on to a new thing where we will basically say Kubernetes is the new ground layer. No, no longer you're just providing these Amazon EC2 instances where this is where you start. No, now you basically can say, we're starting from Kubernetes scratch. And this, by the way, moves the barrier of like, having so much knowledge on how to actually run Kubernetes that you can basically now have a layer where you say, this is what we maintain. And this is really, really interesting. Because now, we've, if you look back to some of our initial problems, you're not allowed, it's difficult, 
another team, another hardware, metrics, maintainability, scalability. These are some of the problems that we can now be solved by s in a general way. And the thing, the thing is like it can actually be solved only once because we are suddenly seeing this where you can have it as a platform. Because although it's both working as a framework, it's also working as a building block. So not only can you use Kubernetes as a framework for, for getting the things that you're kind of recurring across different cloud providers in the same manner, it's also a building block for, for new things you can build on top. And, and did, I never, uh, did I mention you can also save money? I think, uh, as you as talked about, it, like money is a thing because you can get pretty expensive solutions where you are getting a hosted cluster provided by some consultants. I know Pivotal is like gladly to help you do some like really expensive uh, maintenance. But you essentially, this is by, on Google Cloud, for example, you're not even paying for the masters. That's the one thing. You're only paying for what you're actually using in raw resources. So think about this. Now you're suddenly, you're not paying for this huge amount of cluster maintenance, workloads. You're only paying for the raw resources that you would, you would not even be able to do it cheaper yourself. You would actually be able to, to do these things as, as cheap as possible. If you had to make your own cluster, you need to even have more machines than if you were just getting a commodity. So by saving money, we can also raise utilization because I don't know how many people here have like an auto scaling group or maybe that's maybe the most advanced things before like where you're basically saying I want to reach this utilization I and mean, if you're not reaching it, then I want to lower the amount of machines that I have. So by saying raising a utilization, you're also saving even more money by removing both costs from setting it up, but also doing the auto scaling. So for example, if anybody here know a company where they maybe have some ghost resources, for example, like can, you're basically asking maybe, can I delete these resources? And then people say, no, like you cannot. But it's like, nobody's choosing. I don't know what he's doing. Just don't delete it. Just leave it there. And it's like, but nobody's using it. It's just wasting there. It's like cluttering up everything. Like, ah, Kevin, just don't matter. Like, and this is some of the things like, because you're essentially now with Kubernetes, you're actually able to say a new commitment. You're essentially saying Kubernetes gives you insights and commitments as well, because you can basically say that you want to have 10 replicas on the service. And this is a kind of weird thing that you are saying, like, I want 10 replicas, and I want to have my cluster say, give me 10, and I don't care how you get me it, I just want 10. If the one disappears, make a new one, uh, and this is like a commitment you're saying, I want to have replicas, and a replicas in a certain deployment is actually something I don't care about, how many is running, or if it's killed in a minute, I just want 10 all the time. And you're not actually saying, I want 10 machines, because saying 10 machines is actually a different kind of thing. You are saying, I want 10 machines, but you're not saying what is running on it. You're basically saying, I want 10 machines, and you should just trust me in what is on those machines. Because you're essentially, now you're basically able to say to the off team, I want 10 replicas, and you figure out, but I'm not maintaining those 10 replicas, I'm just giving you a description of what I want. So, uh, something is also about over-provisioning. Like, I think maybe, uh, I don't know if anybody can, can, uh, can agree to this, but if you ask boss, come ask me, how, how much resources do we need? And you're saying like, ah, oh, I, I don't want to, to, uh, to lie, but I also want to be sure, so I'm times it by pi in my head. So I'm saying if I need one gigabyte, I'm saying I need three gigabytes. And then your manager goes to, and it's like, he's lying. So if he says he wants three, then you need to times it by pi, because that's normally how it works. So nine gigabytes, and then you're constantly ending up with so much more resources, and you actually, because you're not actually believing in what you're saying, because nobody wants to undercommit, because then you are having more trouble than if you overcommit. And you're essentially now doing some things where you're saying, I, I want to just be sure, but it, with Kubernetes, you actually don't have to worry about these resources because you're kind of defining what is it that I need and what is actually possible. And then the, the cluster, the Kubernetes, will actually figure out how to get you those resources that you actually need and not be uh, worried about how you actually have to 
to, to know ahead what you need. You can change it on the fly. You can say, I want 512 megabytes of RAM, and if you need a gigabyte tomorrow, you just change the description, and then you don't need to reprovision the hardware or change the model for what you're actually deploying. So this is something where it's really interesting, where you're saying you can both have replicas, and you're essentially also having these also scaling, where Kubernetes is built in, where you also have like a CPU scaling. Uh, if it goes beyond 60% uh, of CPU, I want more instances. But you also like, how does also scaling of node works? This is where it becomes really interesting because also scaling nodes is like a little bit, you're sca also scaling inside the cluster with CPU, and you're also, also scaling the nodes. And this is where you're essentially doing something that's uh, both pretty remarkable, but it's something basically based on maybe the cloud provider you have. But because with Google, you're basically able to have Google listening on your Kubernetes cluster. And if, if Google is looking at your cluster, you have to enable it yourself. If it sees that the total capacity is, is greater than your current load, and one of the nodes has not been able to provision new containers and that, it would then con calculate, is it able to take those containers and move it? And if it uh, sees that it can do that, it actually begins to drain the node, and it's in Kubernetes call, it's called taint. It would taint the node, and then every uh, part would be rescheduled, and then it would be, at last it would then kill the node. So you're essentially now you're both bin packing the containers and you don't have to do this with uh, some fancy algorithm yourself. It comes out of the box on, on many of these cloud providers because that's what people want. And this is not actually possible with a, a service called like with Docker Swarm. It's like it's not even able to reprovision your parts if one node disappears. You need to do that yourself. So it's kind of a little bit AI like. So what else is then there other than saving money? Because that's not that interesting for us developers. Like, uh, this is pretty boring. Like, this is something you can tell as a side effect if you want to sell the story. Because it's a pretty good idea of like, basically, if you always can provide a use case of we can save money, then it's pretty much sold there. But, but I think then you're coming back to the other problems that always buy it when it's not done there right. It's, for example, the metrics. Metrics is insight for scaling. This is like the things you need to know to actually know how the system is doing. You need to know what, what's your, how your application is doing and such. And I think this is something that's really difficult because this is where the off teams are basically on hard work for doing this and they're spending months figuring out how to actually collect these metrics, figure out how to, to show them in a good manner. And you're basically having to instrument your app to, to do the right thing. But I think this is how it normally looks. You may have a DevOps team with devs as well, and they basically give you the off team the app as well, and then tell it, here's how it's working and such. But this is where it really becomes uh, the framework, and more or less the building block of these new things. Because essentially, now you're the off team is actually able to inject into your app. So they are basically giving you the possibility of something that's not done before, basically that you are able to deploy your own app onto the Kubernetes cluster. But you're basically having this way of off is still in control because they can basically inject their stuff into your application when you deploy it. So what do you mean by injecting? It's basically you have, for example, you have Prometheus and Grafana injected into your app. And what basically what it would do is that you would come in when you have tried to apply it, Kubernetes would notice that it's coming in, and then the ops team would have a rules of every app that is deployed to this Kubernetes cluster would have these Prometheus going in and catching these uh, metrics, going and showing them in a Grafana on a per app dashboard. And this, suddenly you are saying, like, okay, we are actually now streamlining apps but we're doing it so fast that people can actually deploy the apps themselves, and off teams still have the insights of actually figuring out are apps actually still healthy, or how is their load going, and so forth. And also, we're actually able to do this with Service Mesh as well. And I know Service Mesh, if you maybe heard about it, uh, it's, like, it's even more hype for it. But if I have to really uh, explain it in this really few words, it's basically you're placing your app behind a proxy, and that proxy records stuff that tells the metric to another service. 
That's basically service mesh explained in a few words. So there's a few, few different uh, service meshes. There's a lot of competition in between, but there's basically Envoy, Istio, made by Google, and then there's Conduit, which is made by the people who made Linkerd. And these are actually also really in, able to maybe inject trust, because suddenly the reason why Ops is not letting you deploy when you, you want to do is because they don't trust you. But if they're actually able to control everything you're doing, but you can do it at your pace, because, for example, uh, Conduit and Istio and something, it's pretty easy to actually put in and say a rule. Everything going in can only happen on these rules, for example, port and something like that, but you can also control everything that's going out. So you can basically say, if you're in the extreme, uh, you're actually preventing some attacks to happen where you're not able to call out of the, the thing that has been hacked or something like that. Like you're actually able to control and say, no, contr no uh, express is going out of this container unless it's going to these IPs. And it's like, okay, suddenly you're having total control of all the things that are going on in the cluster. You're also having insights because every service is basically going to this insights and you're suddenly saying, now we're actually having this to work with. Now we're having a, a something interesting. And how does this actually work? Because I think if you're actually able to do all these things from inside the cluster, you're suddenly having these like really advanced systems. And with, uh, with Kubernetes, they adopted this called the uh, RBAC. Called, it's like role-based access control. And what that means is that you're actually able to define roles inside the cluster so that you're not just giving uh, every app full read access to the uh, Kubernetes API. That would be kind of a disaster of who is actually doing what. So what you can do is that you can make these roles that have lesser and lesser uh, roles to, for example, read and write to the Kubernetes API. And this is why you can basically install apps on your Kubernetes cluster that does this once. So there's, for example, a package manager called Helm you can use for, use for Kubernetes. And this is some of the things where I think it's really interesting because it, not suddenly you're, you're basically uh, drawing on t making a new API. And I think this is an example of what is like a, some RBAC you can see here. We're having a GitCube, and GitCube is basically a service that you can be able to push directly to your Kubernetes cluster as a Git push. And here, it's basically showing like what, what does a cluster role, and in here we're basically deploying, now we can define lesser roles after this has been created. So I think maybe we can also agree, like, how much work does it actually take? I actually switched to this round. Because like, I think it's actually supposed to say, like, creating a service is, takes 20%, maintaining a microservice is 80% of the work. I guess that's a weird example. But I think here is an example of how it's working with, and you, the why you need these service messages is because you're having ingress coming in from the internet, you're going to the first service and the second service, and if something happens to the second service, it's pretty easy to notice. But suddenly, you're having actually problems where you're saying, this is actually really complex, maybe even you have more further, where you're getting 500 from one service and you're getting 200 from another. And this is where you're basically you need these kind of insights to actually be able to, to develop your microservices and be able to allow to create these new ones all the time. So I think with better monitoring, less coordination, you can also save money as well. So I think now you have all this time, what are you then going to do? Like I think you're not com we're not complaining anymore that it's going too slow and we're constantly thinking about, um, should we go on vacation? Uh, what can, else can we do? And I think maybe the last thing I want to leave you with is like, maybe suddenly you actually may be able to implement predictable chaos engineering. And it's like, oh, well, 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 that sounds a little bit stupid, implementing chaos deliberately into our service. And I think this is, would actually be something where we get to our next step of like developing software. Because if you can actually deliberately make chaos, we are able to program much more defensively. Suddenly, you're actually you're maybe getting allowed to, to make these services because you're actually, your boss knows that you're actually looking into these stuff. So I think to leave you off, I think basically what, what I think you're getting with Kubernetes is you're getting more responsibility with more tools to work with. So 
Uh, with that, I will just say thank you for your listening, and uh, if there's any question, I will let's take them. <laughs> Does somebody here is actually running? Yeah. Yeah, so you're, you're, that's uh, something called ingress. And it's, it's a really, that's the thing what you're uh, asking for because essentially that's a service where you're saying what kind of rules do I have and also what kind of URLs am I looking for. So there's a really cool project called the uh, uh, ingress nginx where you're basically able to have a global load balancer going into that cluster and then you are able to completely customize it by into small rules and you're actually able to also make the app follow ingress like you can actually commit it to the repository uh, so they're able to constantly for example every time you you make a new branch it gets a new url that you can know so this is really yeah somebody have another question who else is running kubernetes in production uh, who here is, is anybody uh, because i think maybe I think maybe this one thing, like, uh, I have a lot of things, but maybe one of like is like, my boss wouldn't let me. Uh, that's a pretty good one, because I think that's how I normally also have it. Like, it's like your boss is saying, ah, that's good. Like, I know it's pretty interesting, but maybe uh, you should just focus on doing your work and not trying to uh, impress me so much. Uh, but I think uh, this is actually where you can basically say, Kubernetes is so small, actually, you can do it on your own. And uh, these things are actually, so you can do it whenever, for example, you can set up your own uh, git pull and have your own git commit hook and do these things where you can say, then you are seeing, you're actually working with something where you can make less errors, you can focus on, on trying to make more insights and as well as focus on the security part of, of having these applications actually run in controlled environments and not just on whatever cloud provider you necessarily have to work with. So I think that's basically it. Thank you for listening and uh, hope to talk to you in the, in the pause. <laughs>